Okay, so thanks for the introduction, Natalie. As you said, I am Linnell Bugg. I'm part of the Vertebrate Genome Lab at Rockefeller University. And we are one of the production hubs for something you'll hear about in a little bit, um, the Vertebrate Genome Project. And we've been using Galaxy to do all of our reference genome assemblies. So I'm gonna just tell you today about our experience using it and all of our, how basically our pipeline in general, just some general scientific details about the pipeline and the actual like experience of using Galaxy to workflow wise our pipeline and get it, bring it up to scale for, um, to attain those goals of our large, large project. But before we got into that topic, I just wanted to also give some background about myself and my own bioinformatics journey to give some context about why I personally um, vibe with Galaxy's mission outside of how um, our, the Vertebrate Genome Project is using it in our formal partnership. Um, next slide. Next slide. Okay. So my master's project was population genetics of field mice, which meant all the wet and dry lab work was done at a field station miles out from New York City. And our conversational infrastructure was a desktop Mac, iMac. I'm not sure what model it even was because we called it a trash can Mac. And job scheduling was a post-it note and just real life nice values of trying to coordinate amongst um, five or six lab um, lab members trying to get all their DD red seek all their short read, or short read analysis done on the same uh, machine in the same time span all trying to graduate at the same time and so I've gone from that to now my current job where our infrastructure is a veritable lasagna rack of nodes dedicated to generating genome assemblies like you'll see on the bottom right here and you'll learn a little more about the assembly graphs later on but um we are using a newer technology called high fi reads that are both long and accurate which is in my experience a fairly recent thing that came about like around the like 2020 and it blew my mind coming from only Illumina short read sequencing world but it's really revolutionized um, how we approach generating reference genomes of high quality and high contiguity so as I mentioned we are a production hub for the vertebrate genomes project and the goal as you might expect is to generate the genomes uh, reference genome of all the vertebrates and this project is part of like a large blossoming or blooming of initiatives that have recently sprung up and are gener uh, dedicated towards creating reference genomes as resources. The VGP is in fact a part of the Earth Biogenome Project, which is dedicated towards generating reference genomes for all eukaryotic life on Earth, also as exactly what it says on the tin. Um, and we're currently, so that's a big goal. So we've broken it down into phases, um, stepwise phases of getting representation across the vertebrate tree of life. So we're wrapping up phase one, hopefully this year, which is getting an ordinal representative from 260 orders across all of vertebrates. So reptiles, amphibians, fish, and mammals. And um, we also have a signifier for sharks, even though they're not their own high level clade. But in addition to getting to just getting a reference genome for all of those representatives, we want them to be of high quality to facilitate the sorts of um, conservation genetics and population genetic studies that really require a long um, that really require high quality reference genomes. So for our lab as one of the production hubs, this process looks like um, from start to end. We first need to identify the sample source to begin with, and then do all the paperwork required to get that sample from wherever in the world it is over to where we are in New York City. And then the arduous task of data generation is undergone by our very, our very talented wet lab team. So we, for every sample, generate at least two types of um, sequence, two types of sequencing technology for it. Every sample has at least Pack bio high fi reads and high C long uh, high C long range information, and if the DNA is good enough good enough quality, we also have bio nano optical maps for it. And so the high fi reads are what we actually are what are the backbone of the assembly because they make the actual contigs and the optic bio nano optical maps and the high C sequencing provides scaffolding information to help piece those contigs together. At a, into something that's approaching uh, chromosome length. 
So the part that I'm responsible for that we use Galaxy for is the assembly bar part here. We create a high quality draft um, assembly that then goes uh, for manual curation to resolve some parts that the algorithms might not have missed or may have misjoined. And that's uh, after that is finished, then that gets submitted to NCBI or for some um, parts of the VGP, they submit it to ENA, European Nucleotide Archives, in order for these to actually be available as public resources for others to use in their studies. So before I talk about the assembly pipeline, I just have a little slide on what are what is an assembly anyway so we start off for us at least with long reads that um since they're packed by hi-fi reads with 99 percent accuracy they have basically perfect overlaps if they're coming from the same region of the genome so hi-fi as and finds these perfect overlaps and assembles them into contigs that we're very confident in and then you have these pieces called contigs and then we have technologies Ortho orthogonal technologies, such as bio nano optical maps, which label long strands of DNA at uh, predictable motifs. And using those motifs, since you know what they are on the labeled DNA and also in your contigs, because you have the sequence, you can use those maps to orient and reorder your contigs and join them together because you know where they would be on that larger map. We also use high C technology, which is a form of chromatin capture, chromatin conformation capture. So it fixes DNA, um, fixes chromatin with how it looks like within the actual cell. And so DNA being linear, it when it's all scrunched up, it usually tends to interact with sequences that are also from the same piece of linear DNA. So it's more likely that um, sequences on chromosome one, for instance, are going to be interacting with um, other se with sequences on chromosome one instead of sequences on chromosome 10, because they're going to be in another scrunched up ball. So these are the scaffolding technologies that come later. And those just, as I mentioned, really help towards bringing the contigs up to a chromosome scale reference. Um, we also have mentioned I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it as much in this presentation, but there is purging because sometimes the assembly process is imperfect. A lot of times it's imperfect and then we can have false duplicates in one of the um, haplotypes. And that's when the same region of the genome is being represented twice, maybe because the haplotypes there look different enough that the assembler thinks it's two totally different regions of the genome when really they're representing um, say the same gene or the same part. So purging takes care of that by removing that. And it usually does that through looking at coverage analyses and other, um, other information to make um, being mapped onto your primary reference. And on the right, I have just a little example of a snippet from that assembly graph. So the assemblers really put out, they don't put out FASTA files um, natively at this point, they'll put out a assembly graph. And so each node here, uh, where's my cursor? Each node is representing the sequence, and then these edges will represent potential overlaps. And then, so for the, when we create the actual FASTA file that people can use downstream, the assembler will walk this graph by going, say, along this path. And then this path is where the genome is currently homozygous. So it looks the same on both maternal and a paternal haplotype. So both, both uh, assemblies will have this. And then there is some sort of variation here. The assembler has to pick a certain way to go and then keep going. And then say every time it reaches a little bubble like that. And sometimes it can reach a really tangled, complicated region and it will have to break. And that's when that contig ends and you'll have to start from making a new contig. But um, these bubble regions are kind of a bone of contention in assembly because it can be hard for the assembler doesn't know which, how it go, um, which variation belongs to the maternal haplotype and which belongs to the paternal haplotype if you don't know what the maternal and the paternal haplotypes look like a priori. Um, so there's the classic approach to fixing that has been just sequencing the parents, but I'll talk later on about a new approach that has come up recently that uses this same high C information to help identify like, oh, these two are actually on the same haplotype together and it helps phase these contexts properly. 
Um, so this is, I'll start talking about our actual pipeline now, and it has quite a few steps to it, but the first step isn't actually contigging. It's going to be kind of a quality control step just to make sure that the data you're going into the pipeline with matches your expectations. Because at least for us, since we're sequencing vertebrates only, they have pretty predictable patterns based on what clade they're in. So birds are usually like, one not not like one gig one gig base pair long they're not going to be super big mammals are two to three gig and then amphibians can really range the gamut from smaller frogs being like one to two gig to bigger genome frogs being eight gig so it's just a way of going into the assembly process with set expectations based on the data you're generating. And it double checks to make sure that there's like no obvious sample swap. Because for instance, if you think you're going to be sequencing a bird, but then the genome scope tells you that the genome length is actually something like six gig base pairs, you might want to look into what happened and make sure the data is actually correct. So in addition to genome, length, genome scope also gives things such as coverage. So you know how much sequencing coverage you have of your genome, because we usually try to go into the assembly process with at least 30x of PacBio HiFi data. And it also gives statistics such as the, uni how the percent of unique sequence in the genome, like which can help you know how repetitive it is. Uh, a lot of the larger amphibian genomes tend to be very repeat heavy, so we'll it's a pretty distinctive pattern, and it can also help you kind of predict how much of a pain the assembly process is going to be for that sample. So the next step after getting this general picture of things is the actual contigging step, which is what I mentioned before with high phiasm. So just a few terms, getting them out of the way. The real genome, as you know, might well as you know, will have a paternal genome and a maternal genome inside the F1, the individual that we're sequencing, a uh, maternal haplotype and a paternal haplotype. And a lot of approaches in the past have kind of just collapsed them because the assembler is agnostic to what um, which haplotype the sequence is coming from. So we try to get the around that with pseudo haplotype assemblies that create a primary and an alternate assembly. So you'll have perhaps a block of maternal sequence here, but then it'll switch to a block of paternal sequence. And this, is, this results in a, an overall sequence that wasn't actually present in the genome because this switch, um, these these markers should belong with these markers and vice versa. So this can happen when um, a pseudo haplotype assembly is trying to just um, piece things together and it just adds, uh, it sees that these overlap and they'll go together. And as I had mentioned before, one way to get around this is by actually sequencing the parents. So you know what the paternal and maternal haplotypes look like. That's called the trio binning approach. And it's been done in the past with hybrids that just make it a lot easier because if it's a hybrid, they'll, the two usually look much different from each other, but you can also do it just with a child and two parents. And this approach works by getting short read sequences of the parents and finding markers that are present, say only in the mom and a child and markers that are present only in the dad and a child. And it allows you to bin the reads from the child into ones coming from the maternal haplotype and ones coming from the paternal haplotype, and it assembles them separately. And this is really the ground to gra ground tooth, ground truth, cleanest approach we have towards generating haplotype resolved assemblies that don't show this switch of um, this switch of false sequence where maternal and paternal haplotype, uh, maternal and paternal haplotypes interleave with each other. So this is a like very good approach and it's the standard for getting haplotype resolved assemblies, but it's also pretty prohibitive, especially for wild species where you have a sample and you're not necessarily gonna go find the parents. You can't be sure of it and maybe you just can't even 
actually get the sequence from more than one individual. It's also more, um, perhaps it's cost prohibitive because you have to do two, ad two additional library preps and sequencing. And it's a bit uh, more computationally intensive. So there is a recent approach that has um, come about that uses the same high C scaffolding reads in order to phase the um, in order to phase the contigs instead, and we have seen pretty good success with that so far. And that's our new default. So I'm just going to show you some of the results we have with that with a zebra finch. So these are called blob plots, and on the left we have the results from when, with that trio phasing approach with a zebra finch. So this is when we assemble the genome of the zebra finch child and we know what the mom and dad look like. So we're able to fully separate out the haplotypes. And then in the middle, we have that pseudo haplotype approach I mentioned before, which can show those switches between maternal and paternal um, blocks of sequence. And on the right hand side, we have the results from a approach from the high C phasing approach. So just a quick rundown on how to interpret these plots. Each blob is a contig in that assembly. The blobs are colored by which assembly they come from. So for instance, for the trio phasing one, these red blobs are all contigs in hap let's say HAP1 assembly, or called assembly A. And then the blue blobs are all contact from assembly B. And the axes are the parental markers. So say that the x-axis is maternal, uh, is maternal markers and the y-axis is paternal markers. That means that all the blobs from assembly A only have maternal markers. And so it's, they don't have any paternal markers. And all the blobs from assembly B only have paternal markers. They don't have any maternal ones. So this is what a proper, a really properly phased um, haplotype, what a properly phased set of haplotypes would look like. Because most importantly, there's no blobs in the center part because this center part would mean there's content both from the maternal and paternal marker sets. So that means a switch is happening. And that's exactly what we see in the pseudo-haplotype approach. There's a lot of these larger blobs in the middle that show say five, um, 500,000 maternal markers and 1,000 paternal markers. So that means there's switches happening and switches are not real sequence. So that's what we are trying to avoid by using trio phasing or high C phasing. So now that we know what the ground truth looks like and um, what the previous approach also looked like, we can compare it to the high C phasing approach. So there's, you'll notice that there's much fewer of these blobs in the middle with switch, con uh, switch content, with switch error content. A lot of the blobs are properly phased. And so you'll see that it's alternating kind of like it'll be blue and red, whereas it was all from one assembly here. That's fine because even though high C phasing can tell you if two sequences are coming from like the same um, run of DNA, it doesn't know if that DNA belong to the mother or the father. So it can't put them in like a properly like labeled mother father file, but it can ensure that the contigs it's making do contain only maternal or only paternal sequence. And that's exactly what we'll see here because all of the blobs are exactly along the axis. So all these contigs only contain maternal um, markers and only paternal markers. So this is um, just kind of a really revolutionary um, upgrade to genome assembly. And since we do have high C data for all of our species that we're generating at our lab, we have switched to using this approach. And this is how the Galaxy pipeline works currently. It's our default. Um, so that's a lot of words about the contigging or step. There's also scaffolding happening afterwards, which is what brings the actual um, contigs, which are much longer than Illumina contigs, but they're still separate from each other and can be resolved to chromosome length with, sca with additional scaffolding information. So we have things like BioNano and Salsa, which can use those, bio those and the image I showed earlier, the BioNano maps help you um, orient and order the contigs according to the motifs that BioNano was able to detect on the long optical map. 
and the high C range, the high C information gives a uh, long range information and interaction because it's operating under the assumption that sequences from the same linear strand will be interacting more often with each other compared to sequences um, instead of sequences from another linear strand. So the QC we use for this is called like a, a pretext map. It's basically a heat map. And on the left hand side, we have before high C scaffolding, and then the right hand is after high C scaffolding. So this um, is a pretty well resolved one here. And each box just represents one sequence or yeah, one sequence. So say this is chromosome one, two, three, four, five. This is just saying that chromosome one is largely interacting within itself, largely showing intrachromosomal reactions, interactions, and not interactions with any other um, sequence, because that might indicate those need to be joined, which was the case here in this before picture. You'll see that sequence like five is interacting with sequence 11. That's not supposed to happen if these were um, separate pieces. So the high C scaffolding process joins them to make these larger contiguous parts. But there's still some work left to be done after. There's still this like off diagonal signal and they also need to actually name the chromosomes based on sometimes size or syntony with closely related species. And that's what happens when these um, draft assemblies produced by our pipeline get sent out for manual curation. So that's a lot of worries about the um, nitty gritty of the pipeline itself. But so the way the pipeline is um, actually implemented in Galaxy is thanks largely in part to Delphine's work of porting this entire pipeline into workflows. So uh, I know I mentioned only a few programs before, but there's actually way more programs being and software being involved in the pipeline, because not only is all the data generating and data processing steps, we also have all the quality control being automatically run within the pipeline. So each step, each workflow, this is an example of a high fiasm one, I believe, will run high fiasm and then run um, all the QC on it afterwards, such as um, Usco, Mercury, a whole bunch of other um, the contig stats, basic stats such as that, and have all the outputs ready for the user to view in their galaxy history right then and there. And so our pipeline has is kind of organized by that work by that um, flowchart we saw before into a modular some modular steps. It'll start with contigging. Sorry, it'll start with that QC then go to contiguing and then the scaffolding steps. And they can be mixed and matched depending on if you have bio nano data, if you don't have bio nano data, if you have paternal information, if you don't have paternal information. So it's really adaptable for any um, user's situation based on data availability. And so this pipeline has is what I've used to make these um, like 50 plus assemblies so far for the VGP. Um, and the species we've sequenced so far in phase one really run the gamut across the CITES designation scale from critically endangered species like the Australian Corroboree frog, which is being um, decimated like many other amphibian species by chytrid, um, to least concerned species that are still important for our ordinal representation, such as the Amazonian Hudson. And so these just really highlights our, our goal of contributing towards conservation resources by creating these molecular, uh, by creating these reference genomes that you need for molecular population genetic studies, because you really need a good reference genome. And the more contiguous it is, and that can really enable um, studies such as selective sweep analyses, you can get longer runs of homozygosity, and you can also identify um, population specific uh, structural variants, um, which you can't really do with a highly fragmented reference genome. So a lot of, so of these like 50 assemblies, uh, about a fifth of them were run on the Galaxy EU server, which I'm very thankful to the Freiburg team for letting me use up a lot of their um, terabytes and a lot of their compute for a while before I was able to get our own um, instance running within um, the VGL like local infrastructure. So I have, I currently do maintain an instance that takes advantage of our compute. We have within that server rack uh, tw about, we have 28 nodes of 32 CPU, about 400 gig of RAM and one big node of 64 CPU and 1.4 terabytes of RAM. So the really large assemblies go on such as that corroboree frog you mentioned before. And so in addition to like 
um, speeding up the process because we can use the resources we bought for genome assembly to do genome assembly. This also helps um, me teach lab members like in my own lab how to do assembly and how to actually um, how to actually analyze the data that they're generating, which I think goes a lot towards helping them feel ownership over the work that they've done to generate um, the, this very painstaking work of generating the HiFi, BioNano, and HiC data that enables these high quality reference genomes. It also helps us be a service center on campus because sometimes we'll have collaborators outside of the VGP, but on the Rockefeller campus who want to sequence and assemble their own genome and instead of them sending their study species to us and it just disappearing in a black box for a bit, and then they just get an assembly file that they can run with, um, we'll generate the data and then they'll they can assemble that data on their own on this Galaxy instance and I can provide customized help, one-on-one -on -one help with um, them. Since I'm the admin, I can actually look at their history and I don't have to go through the um, peer-to-peer -peer bioinformatics experience of trying to figure out how people organize their own directories. So, cause everything's just laid out very nicely in a history and um, standardized in that way. And that just leads me into how I really do enjoy using Galaxy for teaching. So we have, the VGP has two high quality tutorials available on the Galaxy training network. There's a short version focused on using those workflows that I mentioned and a longer version that goes more in depth and it's really for like self teaching um, and goes in depth as to why we have some of the parameters we have, why we make some of the decisions we do um, in the pipeline. And so they're both available on GTN and they're also what we use when we teach workshops um, about how to do genome assembly. And sorry, and then these workshops have run from smaller in-person tutorials that we run on campus to larger like 40 person attended workshops that um, this one from Faisalia took place across the world and so that one had to be run through um, TIAS with uh, resources um, generously provided by Galaxy EU. It was super helpful to actually be able to see where everyone is at so we can all kind of coordinate and sync up the course at the same pace and it kind of helped uh, mimic the experience of teaching a workshop using my local instance where I can also see where everyone's job is at and we can make sure that everyone's following along properly. And if not, we can see maybe where people are getting stuck and where I would really need to drill in and go back and make sure people understood. And as I, that's personally what my favorite part of using Galaxy is for. It's really streamlined the experience of teaching uh, how people how to do bioinformatics because my experience in grad school was a lot of peer-to-peer -peer teaching and when you would try to teach someone bioinformatics it would end up just teaching them how to use command line which is a different thing and in my experience way more frustrating and worst of all discouraging because my cohort was a lot of ecologists who wanted to answer questions that are ecology questions, but then they end up getting sequencing data and having to learn command line. And it would just feel like it's not an it's not insurmountable, but it is a barrier and a point of frustration for many people um, who are approaching this field completely new to um, sequence analysis. So I personally just really love that Galaxy does help me teach people um, without, <laughs> without having to go through teaching them a little bit of comp sci first. And I might've sped through that a bit, but that was my presentation. And I just wanna give big acknowledgements and kudos to all the members of my lab who helped generate the data needed for these reference genomes to exist, and also the Galaxy team who puts up with my very silly questions and <laughs> constant pinging and helped us actually get this workflow up and running at the scale that it is now to enable all those genomes that you saw before. Um, I have a QR code that you can scan for a link tree, which can take you to all of our GTN tutorials, workflows, and more information and etc. And also, if you know a genomics core facility manager who wants to manage a crew of a, a genome assemblers in New York City, then let me know. We're nice, I promise. And thank you all for your attention. That's it. Thanks so much for your amazing presentation, Lana. Um, <laughs> I'm going to open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions? 
I have one. Yes. <laughs> um, so super great presentation. Um, I actually, so I'm new to the Galaxy team. I'm a communication specialist. I just, I just started a couple of weeks ago, um, but I'm also uh, getting my PhD at Florida International University and I'm currently doing DD rad and will be mm -hmm. transitioning to high C, but I work with invertebrates. Do you, um, is there like another side of like a team similar or some, a team similar to yours that does invertebrate studies? So there's um, there's the Sanger team, which does the Darwin Tree of Life, which just sequences all the life in the British Isles. So they mm -hmm. have more experience with invertebrates than us, especially on the actual extraction side. But I have ran our pipeline with some modifications on um, mosquitoes and spiders, and it's worked fine with some just there's some checks that check for like genes expected in vertebrata. You would obviously change that. And yes, stuff, and stuff like that. But um, it's a good starting point, I would say. And I think that the GTN tutorials have a lot of good knowledge as a reference if you want to like just read it up for that sort of like that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just I just went on your little QR code and I saved that. <laughs> reference it later. Um, <laughs> I'm glad people use it. <laughs> oh no, it's it, I'm super excited uh, about this. And yeah, my my lab right now is building the crab tree of life. Um, Ooh. so. Yeah, it's super cool. And um, I, yeah, it just reminded me a lot of that. And we've mostly, we've mostly done like single gene sequencing um, mm -hmm. with funding re for funding reasons, but my project will be transitioning to high C and full genome sequencing. So I'm super excited to bring that in. So thank you so much for sharing. This was great. Awesome. I'm excited to hear more about the crab tree of life in the future. <laughs> oh yeah. It, a publication should be coming out soon and we're present. Uh, well, I'm not going, but they're, they're presenting in New Zealand um, at the cr uh, crustacean genomics conference. So it, it'll be coming out soon. So. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that was really cool. Um, I wonder uh, <laughs> how much uh, how much effort was it for you guys to set up the Galaxy instance and have it churn through like these huge amounts of data? Um, the setup was mostly just a lot of learning on my part, but that uh, the admin training really helped. I attended that last year, the Smorgasburg admin training. Um, so it was a lot of just self-teaching on my part and some coordination with IT because our HPC team, they're great, but they also like, um, they keep kind of, I feel like a hands-off approach. Yeah, everything's like on one, um, like user space. I have to, in, I think they installed like four packages for me and then I had to install Postgres locally. There was, there was something, <laughs> it, it happened though. <laughs> it was a learning experience and I'm happy it happened. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. Very cool to hear that uh, the admin training gets you on a good path. Yeah, definitely. So are you oh. eventually, so all this data, they go into GenomeArc? Yes. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that. They're all in GenomeArc and they're all publicly available through the bucket. So we part of our workflows that Delphine had designed are also export workflows that get all of the final assemblies as well as all the intermediates in case you want to do like an analysis that's uh, if you want to compare scaffolding methods, then you can just start off the config file instead of the scaffolded one. They're all in GenomeArc in a very predictable structure and publicly available to use. Um, pursuant to our data use policy, which is just don't publish on it before the collaborators do. We're always open to emails about that in case anyone has a specific question, yeah. And then I have a last question. So what's the thing that frustrates you the most about Galaxy? Uh, let's see. Really put me on the spot with that one, huh? Well, that's good then. <laughs> yes. No, the, I mean, it's very personal, but I guess it was that learning how to do all the sysadmin parts of it. Um, Cause I did, when I talked to the HPC guys about it, he, they were familiar with Galaxy from a couple of years ago and they looked into getting it for the campus, but then they realized that would be a full-time employment position. So they didn't do it. <laughs> so that was just my main hurdle. <laughs> all right. I mean, you've proven that's not the case, right? Yeah. But is this more of a failure of documentation or 
that wasn't a failure. It was just hard. <laughs> I haven't run into any major big failures like yet. <laughs> That's so. Well, thank you for an awesome presentation. I have about a million questions, but I'll try to keep ah, myself. Okay. <laughs> just a few. Uh, on a different, on, so you, you mentioned you've been sort of teaching and sort of you know, running through tutorials. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how that goes for you. Um, you know, if you had any sort of thoughts or comments about you know how to. I don't know how to simplify it, how to make it, or maybe the other way, maybe make it um, more detailed. So, you know, kind of take away some of the magic. I mean, you tell me, you know, what, what if anything can we do to make that process even easier? Or of for, using the tutorials one on one or using them for like teaching? Uh, both. Okay. Cause yeah. for, I've been using them mostly for teaching like workshops with like an instructor, like not asynchronous workshops. So we've been doing them by having like, an hour or so of lecture on theory and concepts behind assembly and then a bit of practical where after we just learned about how hi-fiasm and olc graphs work then the use then the um, students can actually run hi-fiasm on their own and then get out that gfa file we can look at it in bandage and see what that assembly graph looks like so we have had, I, I like the approach of having lecture interspersed with some practical parts to yeah. give students kind of like a little bit of a break from just like an onslaught of stuff and actually get to use that knowledge and use it practically. That's my opinion for the like synchronous teaching with regards to like um, self-teaching of off just the tutorials on their own. I think, I mean, everyone self-teaches a little differently, but I think currently the long tutorial with um, some parts of practical to follow along is, I think that's a good approach. I see. And then for the, the synchronous, it sounds like you're not running the whole workflow then. You'll just kind of run individual steps. Like Yeah, we do like parts. So the way I had it set up was like, we'll do it um, like alternating for the contigging and for the bio nano scaffolding, because those are fairly quick. And then for the more involved parts like purging, mm -hmm. which is like a whole, as you know, like a whole bunch of stuff um, yeah. as a pipeline or the, the prep for BWA alignment and the high C scaffolding, I'll have them do it once and then I'll show them how a workflow can do it faster to also like bring in the idea of workflows and pipelining mm -hmm. your stuff for reproducibility. And um, so we've been talking about potentially having like um, like a really simplified interface where you just like, you know, drag, you know, we don't have it today, but you can imagine just like dragging and dropping in, I don't know, your, your hi-fi data, maybe plus high C and like one button click go. Like, Dream. You, would that dramatically, um, you know, change the, the landscape that would be make it so much easier or is it sort of um, easy enough as it is today? I think that the answer to that question would depend on who you're asking it to. I think it would be good for people who are a bit newer to it, but then once they want to go, maybe they want to look at some of the yeah. intermediate files or what's going on, they might get a bit frustrated. Um, personally, I, I like how the interface looks now. Um, yeah, I think it's an appropriate level of detail. Yeah. I, I agree with you, but I, you know, I, I don't, I'm no longer have that sort of beginner's mindset. You know, it's like obvious to me, oh yeah, we have tools there. We have, you know, history there, Yeah. So, but you know, so I've, I've kind of lost touch with that sort of, um, you know, that mindset, but, but it sounds like, you know, you're kind of also, um, if you sort of feel like there's an appropriate level of detail where it's not overwhelming, but, um, but it exposes the key results. Yeah. Cause I think sometimes people like if they just run people will want to know what else like comes out of the tool like they click and they just get only one result or like it's a little it gets a little black boxy so the way it is now i can show them all the other like intermediate results and some of the other outputs like with bio nano instead of just a file yeah. they can i can show them the um the, con the hybrid scaffolding report and so show them what happened in it um, or like with the purge dupes workflow, instead of just getting a single purge assembly, I can be like, oh, this is the actual mapping that happened and this is the coverage and so forth. Right. 
Right. It really depends, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think for people who are like working on their own project, it is helpful and they want, because they want to know what's happening to yeah. all of their data throughout it. Yeah, yeah I, guess, I guess, you know, if people are actually signing up for a longer form tutorial, you know, they're you know, quite invested in the out outcomes and want it to be successful. Yeah. And, and I don't want to monopolize all the time here, but but what about on the research side? I mean, I think, you know, we're at sort of phase one at the level of a few hundred genomes. And then the ultimate is like, was it 70,000 plus? 70,000. <laughs> um, like, I, I'm, you know, how do you see that playing out? Are you just going to keep growing and growing and growing your cluster at Rockefeller? or I, I think we need to have other sequencing hubs. Like I, I would hope so. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, like ideally in like, the area like local based sequencing hub like Farouk is setting up one in the Middle East um, the Sidra hub they've got their own little um, galaxy instance he's assembled Arabian horse um, dromedary camel and McQueen's bustard all there all very um, locally important species that he has a connection with and so I think that's the approach we'd have to use to really scale things up that's awesome. Are you in, in, in sort of communication with them as they get stuck or need help getting started? Yeah, um, I gave them like all my notes and stuff on how I had set up our own cluster because to interact with Slurm. I don't remember oh. what the Sidra HPC uses, but um, yeah, Farouk is like a long-term collaborator of ours. So yeah. That's awesome. So let's award you a medal for being our ambassador. So <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, well, thank you. I, I should. Uh, I should. I thank should you for your questions. <laughs> but thank you so much for all your work and uh, your ambassadorship. I, I, so, in the lab, who's um, who's the primary user? Is that you or? It's mostly me, and then some of the wet lab team will do assemblies from time as their as their own time permits. But I'm the one pushing a lot of them through. Yeah. Okay, I, I just so that Mike's question about simplified interface, perhaps that might work for them. That's, yeah, but, but, I mean, but, maybe you could have an option of like, I don't know, like toggle. I've, yeah, an option or I mean, it, how simplified are we? Like, the simplified talking? view doesn't necessarily need to hide information. It's just mm -hmm. um, getting it well, closer because now uh, I, I've experienced this too. Like you have to push users to using the workflow. You have to tell them explicitly, go do this with the workflow now um, because they know how to use the tools because they're really in your face because mm -hmm. they're always on the left side. But you have to tell them, you know, don't waste your time, do workflows. Um, and if, you know, just the workflows were a little bit more prominent, um, I think that would already make a big difference. Split the sidebar workflows and tools. <laughs> That's what's happening, more or less. Yeah, that's that's okay. coming. Kind of. Well, thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you for all your time and attention. <laughs> I mean, now if, if you have any requests whatsoever, I mean, you have our full attention. <laughs> <laughs> Request for what? I want a medal. Uh, I mean, kind of uh, building on Maris's question, you know, is there anything that we can help with uh, from, I don't know, installation, uh, management, uh, functionality, display? I mean, you tell me, is, you know, you have our full attention. Is there anything that we can help you with? I can try to collate some like feedback and like people like the more, because I also don't have like as much of a beginner's mindset anymore, but I can yeah. try and think of what um, some of my students have said about the interface. Um, and just say like, get feedback on that. Um, but right now, off the top of my head, I don't think I have anything in mind. Okay. Well, <laughs> Sorry. Well, I mean, there. I think there are some. You all know how to reach me, so and I know how to reach you, so. <laughs> I mean, I think there would there, potentially there be some more technical. You really want? I mean, you can kind of drive feature development, sort yeah. of. Yeah. You know, so. I want the check boxes back on the main history page. I don't know if I'm like not. I don't know if I'm Shared using it wrong. Yeah. Because I I use the um I like using the big history in the middle and not really the sidebar one. Um, but I'll make a, I think I was gonna make an issue before today, but uh, the checkboxes no. disappeared from the main maybe one. maybe you wanna sort of come to our one of our UI meetings to sort of explain your pluses and minuses so we can sure. If you just send me the I'll, details, I'll sure. Uh, there's a hand up from Francis. What's up? 
Yeah, no, just uh, one issue or one way of getting feedback is is actually asking the, the students when you're doing course mm -hmm. development, like at the end of your workshops to actually have a few questions directed specifically about the UI or, or how Galaxy works and so forth. Yeah, I'll do that in the future. Thank you for bringing that up because I think we do ask for feedback. It usually ends up being about our teaching though, because yeah, yeah, yeah but this is but an I, opportunity. We can always throw in more questions about the actual UI, like what would make it easier and stuff. Thanks. Were most of the tools in your workflows already in Galaxy? Sorry, the and, first half got cut off. Sorry, were most of the tools that you're using in your um, pipelines already in Galaxy? And if not, what was that process like to bring them in? Are there well, ways to streamline um, that? When I came in to the project was like 20, late 2021. So they were all already in Galaxy because that was, I think, what everyone was working on right before I got there. So I came in at a, um, at a good time. Uh, there's been a couple of tools we've had to add, like we've changed scaffolders from Salsa to Yes. We've um, also just continually had to update tools as they've been upgrading. And so I enjoy that process. Like I've been a little bit more involved in just pushing like little tool updates. I get to use GitHub and I'm no longer a little GitHub baby. But um, so that was enjoyable for me <laughs> to try, try and figure out how the tool, it's also good to know how the tool wrappers are actually like working and since i have since i am in charge basically of the instance i like having i like knowing what's happening like on the back end and it helps me troubleshoot if something goes wrong and sometimes it's as simple as like someone gave a wrong file type or just the genome is too big and it just isn't gonna work <laughs> i don't know if that answered your question but yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's awesome I'm sorry, just just one more thing from yes. um, from me. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to um, highlight um, some more of the work that's been doing uh, that's been being done in Galaxy. Um, and yours is super awesome. Would you mind if I reached out to you um, so Oops. that I can um, write up a little bit more about it for for our, our communications? Yeah, of course. Um, okay. My email is. I mean, it's on the slide and I think Natalie has it. I can put it here. Bye. OK. Thank you so much. I'd really appreciate it. Of course. I feel like this is something um, a lot of the community would enjoy. So <laughs> I just put my email in the chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Linnell while we've got her here? If not, thanks everybody for joining today's community call. Uh, the next one that we'll have is on May 4th, uh, and we'll have uh, Jeremy talking about Galaxy for Cancer. So we'll see you on the May 4th uh, community call. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.